Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay, broadcasting this week from New Haven, Connecticut, with our 200th podcast episode. And it's kind of hard to believe that we've already gotten to the number 200. As some of you may know, I joined Quillette in 2017 as an editor and occasional writer, And at first, I thought of the podcast as a sideline to my main job. But as our listenership has grown, it's become a more central part of the job and something I've really come to love doing. So thanks to all of you for listening to the podcast and helping me become a podcaster. Now, in most cases, the Quillette podcast is kind of a one-person operation. I choose the guests, record the interviews, edit the audio files, add a few advertisements, and then publish the finished podcast for all of you to download. But this week, the podcast guest was chosen by my boss, Quillette founder and editor-in-chief Claire Lehman. And this is something I am at pains to emphasize because today's guest is me. And I didn't want anyone to think that I had called my own number for podcast number 200. Now, the episode you're about to hear is excerpted from a really long conversation that Claire and I had over Zoom earlier this month, and it wasn't possible to air all of it. But even with all the cuts, Claire and I still covered a lot of topics. These include what it's been like for me to make the transition from a Canadian journalist to what is essentially an Australian journalist working in Canada. We also talk about my professional background as a U.S. tax lawyer and the lessons it taught me about life satisfaction and why law wasn't for me. Then we get into the problem of audience capture in media and my theory of what makes a good podcast. This includes a discussion of how, in my own interview and audio editing style, I evolved from trying to emulate the ruthlessly edited style of national public radio to more of a longer, more conversational style that's probably better suited to the podcast medium. I hope you find it interesting, but either way, I promise that we won't be making this a habit. Next week, I'll go back to being on the other side of the microphone after this brief taste of what it's like to play the role of guest on our own Quillette podcast. Now, for the listeners who are not aware, you're Canadian and you live in Toronto. And what's interesting about the situation is that Quillette is actually an Australian-based magazine. What's that like working for an Australian magazine, but being able to report on local issues in your environment? It started dawning on me when you know I'd be doing these podcasts and I'd be interviewing someone here in Canada. A few weeks ago, we had Andrew Lawton on, who's a Canadian writer, and he talked about the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa earlier this year. And during our conversation, I kind of periodically found myself interrupting him and, you know, he'd say CTV and I'd say, oh, CTV, it's a, it's a large television network here in Canada. Or he mentioned a Canadian political figure, I'd explain who that was. This has sort of become a habit for me. It's only when I step back from that, that I realize the reason I'm doing that is because most of the people listening to this podcast aren't in Canada. And it's only through little gestures like that, that it's sort of just gradually dawned on me that even though I live in Canada, in a way, I'm no longer really Canadian journalist per se. Most of the people who read the articles I edit are outside Canada. And it's been a liberating experience. You know, Canada is almost 40 million people, but it, in its professional subcultures, it feels like a very small country. It's very clubby. No one likes to be too far outside the pack. You've got direct experience of that because you've been working in the Canadian journalism scene for quite some time. Yeah. And the National Post, which is the newspaper that I started working at in 1998, it was conceived as a breach. It was like, we're going to break away from this pack mentality that Canadian media has. I think it succeeded to some extent, not so much because it's an incredibly conservative newspaper. I think by international standards, I don't think it ranks that conservative, but it was one of the first media projects, or at least mainstream media projects, that we're going to break away from the pack mentality of Canadian media. But it's it's very difficult. And Twitter, I think, has exacerbated that in all kinds of contexts. Because as soon as someone is seen as an outlier, Twitter provides the tools to come down hard on them. I mean, you know how Twitter works. It's like, does XYZ Corporation really want to have an employee who believes this kind of thing? And mm-hmm. if you're a Canadian journalist, you know you're always one bad tweet away from having that happen. 
working for an Australian company has been nice because no one can do that to me. And it took me a couple of years to realize that, that I was kind of free of that phenomenon because it's much more difficult to go to somebody like you mm. and, and say, <laughs> John's a bad person. He's violating these unspoken agreements in Canada about what we're not supposed to talk about. People have tried. Well, people have tried, but I, it's not just that. I mean, I think you have a very stiff backbone, but it's not just that. I don't think you particularly care what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say in Canada. In, in the same way that I totally am uninterested in, in getting involved in the whole Australian argument about what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say. Because I'm sure Australia has its own version of this sort of thing. Yeah. I almost feel like setting up an exchange program for people where, you know, I don't know, somebody in New Zealand and somebody in Ireland, you know, the media companies could swap journalists so each of them could report independently <laughs> in their own home countries, but for organizations that are resistant to this clubhouse mentality. Related difficulty that we have in Canada, because you, you and I talked about this once, you said that Twitter isn't as maybe pernicious or widespread in Australia, because you're not so much consumed by the 24 seven American media market. But in Canada, our journalists are so completely obsessed with everything that's happening in the United States. And there's morbid fear that whatever happens in the United States will happen to us here in Canada, and that everyone in Canada has to have an opinion on everything that was on MSNBC or Fox News 20 minutes ago. And I think from what you've told me, that's not so much the case in Australia, which if that's the case, it sounds like a good thing. Yeah, there's a time zone difference. And then there's just a huge barrier in terms of the issues that are being debated and talked about in the United States are different. There are there are some overlaps. When the Me Too movement happened, obviously that came to Australia. But otherwise, we don't really debate things like abortion or gun control, those issues. The abortion thing is interesting because I mean, we're having this conversation a couple of months after the U.S. Supreme Court opened the door toward essentially the outright prohibition of, of abortion in states that want to do that. I can understand why millions of Americans freaked out about that. What is less easy to explain is how the Canadian media, and to a certain extent, the Canadian political class went nuts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's all these breathless articles, you know, it could happen in Canada. And of course, it could not happen in Canada. It absolutely could not happen at all. But there is this kind of morbid desire to feel swept up in the apocalyptic culture war of the United States. But when you take a step back and you look, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like the, the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have any jurisdiction in Canada. You know, I, I would step people through, like, here are the things that would have to happen in Canada for abortion to be illegal. It'd be like seven or eight massive political steps, none of which have any mainstream appeal to Canadian politicians or judges. One of the reasons it's so difficult to be a Canadian journalist is you kind of inhabit a sort of dark fantasy zone where we're one step away from a January 6th riot, we're one step away from illegalizing abortion, we're one step away from a Donald Trump figure taking over Canada. None of these things are true. How much is that just driven by people consuming American media? It's kind of like inhabiting this action movie. Living in Canada sometimes is, is like you're watching some really boring show on TV and then during the commercials you, you flip over to something a little racier on the other channel and that's, you know, American politics, American culture war stuff. And then you, you don't flip back. And also, for Canadian journalists, you tweet about Trump and you get a thousand retweets. You tweet about your local provincial premier. And by the way, in Canada, provincial premiers have a ton of power. But like if you tweet about the premier of Manitoba, you're not going to get a thousand retweets, right? And so part of it was just sort of behaviorist conditioning. I want to go back to your beginnings. Now, you didn't train as a journalist, did you? No. And I <laughs> these days I tell people to avoid hiring people trained as a journalist. No one that works at Quillette is actually a trained journalist. And that's not a policy. It's just happened organic. By the way, so journalism school is great. You know, if you want to become the publisher of, say, a small newspaper or you're taking over a website, you want to learn how to do things like copy edit, do audio editing, I don't know, Photoshop. Right. Like there, there, there's all sorts of technical skills, basic reporting. However, <laughs> a guy like Jamie Palmer, who's our colleague, who works in England, Jamie's kind of this, he just kind of stumbled into the job Mm -hmm. You know, he's just a natural born cultural critic. And I mean, you've had this experience, I'm sure, where you've met people at conferences and they don't imagine themselves to be writers and you say, hey, why don't you write about this? And then they send you something that is better than stuff that mm -hmm. is sent to you by people who have had 10 or 15 year careers at newspapers. There's very few other careers like that. Like there are no dentists out there who just kind of like walk into a dentist office and say, hey, what do you know? I'm really good at dentistry. 
Well, there's, there's a lot of variation in talent and I'm lucky in that I've been able to spot talent and have had a few big wins over the years. It's extremely variable and a degree doesn't make up for lack of innate talent. Uh, as I think you know, my formal training was in, in engineering and then in, I was a US lawyer. For the seven people listening to this podcast who know anything about international tax law, so I did cross-border transactions. I worked, I worked at a, the New York City office of a Canadian law firm. Our specialty was saving big companies a lot of money on their cross-border transactions. So we had to know a lot about Canadian tax law and U.S. tax law. And I handled, at a very junior level, the U.S. tax side. I had this well-thumbed copy of the Internal Revenue Code, which I, I still have, and, and the regulations promulgated there under, as we like to say. And in any career, you have to ask yourself, what are the things that sustain the people in this profession. For some people, it's money. When I was doing corporate law, it was like, how many zeros? You know, I'm working on a $900 million transaction. Well, I'm working on a $900 billion transaction. Yeah, everything was about zeros. And for those people, that's what sustained them. For you and me, I think a lot of it is we published an article that we're proud of. It's influential and people read it. And that's the payoff. And if you if you don't get a payoff from that, yeah. then this isn't the profession for you. No, that's right. And I think both you and I, one thing we are privileged to experience through editing other people's work is just learning about other people's experiences, learning about a new topic. You know, if you're a curious person, being an editor is a remarkable way to just be reading about novel situations, novel events, novel topics. It's it's a huge part of it. And and also, you know, as you know, I'm a ghostwriter also. Ghostwriting is great because you can go really deep into it. So I think you know that I wrote a, a book with a guy who, you know, he was in the plastics industry, of all things. And I loved it because, you know, I'd, I'd go to factories and, you know, I've written books with politicians. And, and one thing that's nice Editors at Quillette are expected to do a lot of their own fact checking. Where you're reading an article for Quillette, you're editing it, and it's persuasive, and you're 99% sure that the author is correctly quoting or citing or paraphrasing, say, a peer reviewed paper. But you just download and look at the paper just to make sure. You mm -hmm. can't read every source front to back. But sometimes by the time you finish the editing, you might have looked at six or seven sources and, and learned a lot. Mm. In the space of an afternoon, you kind of have become an armchair expert in an area that left to your own devices, you would never do that reading, but you're kind of forced to as an editor slash fact checker. And, and I love that part of the job. It gives you a natural resistance to running the same article over and over and over. Because if you edit an article and you don't learn anything from editing that article, chances are it means you've published too many articles of that type. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Okay, so the summer is over. For a lot of us, it's time to get back to school or to bring renewed focus to our jobs. And maybe you're asking yourself why you're stuck focusing on lingering problems instead of new solutions. And BetterHelp is here to remind you that a therapist might not just be able to help you feel better and get more out of life. He or she may also be able to help you get out of productive ruts and perform to your potential. And I can vouch from personal experience that therapy is also great for helping you decide when it's time to launch yourself into a completely new career trajectory altogether. I've been there. If therapy is something you're thinking of, BetterHelp is a particularly convenient and affordable option. It's online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat, letting you choose whether or not you want to see anyone on camera. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists at any time. Quillette listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp by going to betterhelp.com slash Quillette. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Q-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. -E. And now back to our Quillette podcast. And we're both aware of a trap that evident in the current incentive structure of the media where certain certain journalists or commentators focus on one niche topic and can sort of lose perspective. There's a phenomenon, I think it's called audience capture. Yeah. You and I have observed this in some of our writers. And, and I think, you know, to be fair, we've we've lost writers to audience capture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I would have been a victim of it myself at one point or another. So I'm, I'm a little older than you by a lot. I, <laughs> well, I know you remember the day before social media, but at least five or 10 years of my journalistic career was spent in the pre-social media era. So this would be like the very early 2000s. 
And there we experienced, I would say we had the opposite of audience capture. Because social media didn't provide any feedback mechanism, you had these columnists who literally just wrote whatever the hell they wanted because there was no way for the audience to signal like this is super boring and I'm not reading it. At least in the modern era, when someone is boring or a blowhard or doesn't have anything to say or ignorant, there's social media provides a way for people to say, well, you know, you got 17 facts wrong there. Uh, when I started in journalism, you had these great eminences in the field of punditry who had been writing columns for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and mm. they wrote a column every week because they wrote a column the previous week. And it was like, well, that's what columnists do. And these people were <laughs> kind of very self-indulgent. You would have columnists writing, especially around Christmas time when people really started phoning it in, because I was a copy editor when I started out in journalism, like writing columns about like their favorite restaurants. Like these days, if you if you wrote a column like that, someone like me, <laughs> some obnoxious, would screenshot it and say, really? What's going on here? You didn't really get audience capture because the audience had no way to capture you. And now we have the opposite effect where someone writes about 10 subjects, they get the most response about one, they migrate toward that one until their editor, maybe right. somebody like you or me says, mm, you know, like, let's, you think you'd vary it up. You're a smart person, maybe. And they say, well, screw you. I'm going to go to Substack and charge people $5 a month so they could read 17 pieces a week about my favorite subject. Economics being what they are, all you need is a thousand people to pony up that five bucks a month. And that person has a pretty good side hustle and they don't have to listen to you and me. There's more freedom is what you're saying on the one hand. But on the other hand, as we both know, audiences can be demanding of certain positions. And if you take a certain position on one topic, sometimes audiences or segments of an audience demand that you take another position on a completely different topic. I saw recently that you tweeted about getting vaccinated and it caused a bit of a stir. I don't know if you were surprised by that or not. You know, I, I'm unusual in that I tell my audience pretty directly, if you come here for the science, you're going to get the science. I was tired of getting these DMs from people. It's like, oh, John, you know, I love the way you call bullshit on gender stuff. So here's an article by like a Romanian chiropractor about how mRNA vaccines are killing hundreds of thousands of people. And like, no, no I'm not. <laughs> I, th I think one of the, the, the most frustrating things for me was during COVID was when people said, you've changed. <laughs> and I yeah. changed for what? <laughs> I was not an anti-vaxxer a couple of years ago. If you have a more evidence-based view on things like gender, then you're going to have, in my mind at least, it, you're going to have a more evidence-based view on public health. Well, I mean, you've changed teams. I mean, a lot of politics is seen as as, as as like a sports contest. You know, it's like that Seinfeld joke where the players change, but you keep cheering for the same team. So you're cheering for the uniform. Like the joke in Seinfeld was you're cheering for laundry. <laughs> and for a lot of people, there's something similar going on where yeah. to be skeptical about vaccines is seen as a conservative or like, I don't know, liberty focused position. Mm. So when they make that accusation at you, I don't think they mean, oh, you used to be a vaccine skeptic and now you're vaccine credulous. They mean the postures I associate with you are postures I associate with liberty and skepticism toward governmental overreach Mm -hmm. And since I define vaccines as a species of government overreach, I therefore see you as having mm -hmm. changed. Yeah. Sometimes you get a message from somebody who, you know, you recognize their name on social media because they followed you for years, or maybe they've given you news tips. And for a person like that to then come at me and say, you know, you've greatly disappointed me because I can see you've drunken the Pfizer Moderna Kool-Aid or whatever... Even if what they're saying to me is nonsense, mm. you know, human beings are social creatures and that stings, right? It, it arouses a feeling of guilt. It doesn't matter that the underlying issue is, is ludicrous like that. I'm disappointed that you don't believe two plus two equals five. Putting that aside, there is something inside that that registers that say, you know, I must, I, I must have done something wrong. This person's disappointed. What happens is for a lot of people... They just don't say anything about those issues because they don't want to get that. They don't want to have that bad feeling. I think my experience with backlash over vaccines made me empathize with American conservatives who are critical of Trump. Prior to COVID, I, didn't, I wasn't fully appreciative of how 
brave some of them were and how much hostility they receive on a day-to-day basis. We all know about left-wing cancel culture because we've published dozens and dozens of articles about it. We've published a book on it, but there is a parallel phenomenon among conservatives as well. And it's just as morbid where they actually are, are, are accusing you of spreading propaganda that's killing or they'll have personal stories. My uncle died a week after he took one of these vaccines. He was never missed a day of work in his life. He was, you know, ran three marathons, got vaccinated and, and died. It doesn't matter that the story makes no sense, but they believe it and they believe that you're advancing a narrative that contributed to that person dying in the same way that I know you've been on the receiving end of this is that there's an equally lurid thing. Unless you believe gender ideology, unless you affirm, affirm, affirm every child's attestation of being trans, they're mm. going to be driven to suicide and their blood is going to be on your hands. On both sides, you see this where it's this deeply personal, medicalized species of debate where disagreement isn't just violence, but it leads to death. I mean, I've had people over to my house for coffee, you know, to talk about their experience being cancelled by progressive mobs. And then I receive angry emails from them saying, you know, I can't believe you haven't stood up on this one issue of our time that is, you know, beats all other issues you know, vaccine fascism and that kind of thing. That's happened multiple times. I have a question about that, which is you and I, we've talked about this before, where we've published people, they started on the left and then they hit the center and they published for Quillette, but then like they kind of keep going and next thing you know, they're they're unusable as writers because they've kind of gone loopy on the other side. But when you see that, but when you see that, do you ever think, oh my God, have I done that? Like, does it ever give you this sort of scary thought? Like, are people looking at me and thinking... And, and you, you start cataloging the issues and saying like, well, am I crazy on this issue? Am I crazy on this issue? Like, <laughs> you know, that thing was like, if, if everyone in the room is crazy, maybe you're the crazy one. Yeah, when yeah, I yeah. see so many people go loopy during COVID on both sides. Am I the crazy one? Yeah. We haven't really talked about the podcast, some of your favorite ones. You know, the podcast has been an interesting experience because people listen to the podcast if they know me from Twitter and they listen to the podcast, they'll say, you're a lot more centrist and reasonable than I expected. From social media, they just expected my podcast would be just nonstop snark. You know, <laughs> would just like the whole podcast would be having some guest on and just making fun of them the whole time. Yeah, just like a, a, a series of snide one-liners. And then people who know me from Quillette, from the written material have exactly the opposite reaction. They'll listen to the podcast and say, oh, I didn't know you were funny. Or I didn't know you had a family. Like, because from my stuff on Quillette, a lot of it is, it's in keeping with the sort of quasi-academic tone of of Quillette. Whereas when we're having conversation like this, it's just your personality comes out whether you like it or not. You don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. You can manicure your personality in the written word. You can't manicure your personality in a conversation like this. I'd say my podcast personality is who I am. Affable. (laughs) <laughs> the Twitter version of me is a disguise. It's, it's an artifact. To a certain extent, you can learn more about a person by listening to 30 seconds of them on a podcast than a 5,000 word essay. Because you've probably had this experience where even when you're writing a really long piece, you adopt a particular tone, but there's, there's no way you can do that on a podcast. So do you remember the episode where we had Leon Wieseltier on? Longtime literary editor at The New Republic, got quasi me too Made the interview a little awkward, but he was fun about it. A traditional way to approach that interview would have been either to go heavy into the Me Too business or go heavy into like, hey, let's talk about the best writers that the United States has produced and that you publish book reviews on in New Republic, which also would have been boring. That interview was fantastic because he talked about the time that he had a bit role in The Sopranos. Do you remember that? He was on The Sopranos. For one episode, he had like some bit role and he was so funny and interesting talking about it. He was funny and interesting talking about it because he's a raconteur. And some people are just good raconteurs. And interestingly, those people, you don't want to get them to talk about what they're supposed to talk about. Because if you talk about what they're supposed to talk about, they have like 17 bullet points that their publicist put in front of them if it's a book. Or they're bored because everyone's asked them about, you know, you're the world's biggest expert on pigeons. Tell me about pigeons. And like, you can tell they're just tired of talking about pigeons. What they really want to talk about is the time they put a big pigeon suit on in the Macy's parade. You have to find that kind of stuff because often those are the best interviews. How do you uncover those 
vignettes as a as a host how do you dig into it and discover those sometimes it's like at the end of their wikipedia entry and by the way sometimes this ends disastrously um and well the nice thing about podcasting is you can cover up your disasters in the editing process so there is a very famous person i'm not going to say his name because for a reason that will make sense as i describe this this person's mother I had no idea. Like this person's mother was was a famous television entertainer in the late 20th century. I was like, oh my god, I had no idea. They were on a bunch of shows that I'd seen. So then, I, I as planned, I I asked him. I says, hey, so let's talk about your mom. You know, she was on the show, and the guy said, stop the tape, stop the tape. And I said, well, what's going on? And he told me he said that his enemies on social media have gone after his family, and so he makes a point. He he doesn't even mention his mom's name. And and this was an interview, I, I try and usually get a laugh out of a guest or at least like try and get them to, eh, you know, be casual. But this was, this was a guy who I never, never got him into that zone. And you have to take your guests as they are. Nothing's worse than an interview where the interviewer comes in with a game plan and the, it's clear that the guest is not suited toward the game plan. And and that's part of the fun of podcasting is is making those sort of game time decisions about well, this, this, this isn't working. Where, where can I go with this? And trying to put yourself in a listener's shoes. Because with podcasts, it's so easy. You know, listener gets bored. That's the button is right there. You know, you just hit it. Second later, you're listening to Rogan or, you know, you're listening to Sirius. And, and I do that too. I think to be a good podcaster, you have to love podcasts. And now a message from the Commercial Break Comedy Podcast, which has got to be a commercially successful operation since they're the ones with enough money to advertise on the Quillette podcast instead of vice versa. The commercial break features two longtime friends, Brian and Chrissy, who get together each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to tease out the absurd elements of modern life, of which, as we all know, there are many. It's one of Apple's top three improv comedy podcasts and is available on all major podcast players and at youtube.com slash thecommercialbreak. Now, look, unlike at the Quillette podcast, you're not going to get a lot of black turtleneck stuff about, you know, the demise of liberalism, but you're going to get a lot more about important topics such as psychic readings gone awry, and why would anyone want to date a ghost? And you're probably going to laugh a lot, which I like to think you do occasionally here at Quillette, but at the commercial break, that's the main point. The commercial break is available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, or you can visit tcbpodcast.com. That's tcbpodcast.com or go to youtube.com slash the commercial break. And now back to the Quillette podcast. One thing I've noticed being a guest on some podcasts is that it's much easier to answer questions if they have some specificity. Sometimes people ask really big, broad, abstract questions that actually no one in the world can answer let alone yourself. <laughs> I think the, the wrong way to do it is say, well, you've asked three questions. Let me start with the first. And then oh, remind me what the second was. Oh, well, I'm going to answer the third. And then because I think that will help the second. I think the best way to deal with that is go to the part of the question that's the most interesting. Sometimes you have to be, even though you're a guest, you essentially have to be the show producer where you decide mm-hmm. what the audience wants to hear. Because the host, they're, they're not on their game. And one of you has to be thinking about the listeners. And so sometimes that's the guest. And, and as a guest, you say, well, guy asked three questions. What's the most interesting question? And what's the most interesting way to answer that question? And I guarantee you that if you find an interesting way to answer that question, which 90% of the time is by way of example, podcasting and writing are the same in the narrow sense that people love concrete examples. If you tell a good story that answers part of the person's question, they're going to forget all the other parts of the question that they asked you, especially if you answer it in a way that just naturally segues to something that you know they're curious about anyway, and then you can forget the life, the universe, and everything, big jumble of questions they asked you beforehand. I mean, ultimately, the goal is to get to a natural rapport, and sometimes you never get to that. And usually the reason you never get to that is often the person has a list of questions and and asks them in order, which is, I think, the worst way to do it. The host isn't reading the room. I mean, sometimes it's just two people in the room, but you still have to read it. (laughs) Has your style evolved as a podcast host over time? Yeah, well, it evolved because of, so this is the maybe the third or fourth time I've mentioned him, is uh, Jamie Palmer, our colleague. Mm -hmm. One thing 
<laughs> that I think we both like about Jamie is Jamie isn't shy with criticism. Yeah. He, he said to me outright, he said, John, your podcast needs to be longer. Because yeah. remember when I started out and I was listening to a lot of national public radio back then and NPR producers are just like brilliant with their cuts. You could listen to a six minute Steve Inski interview and you'd learn a lot more than a 30 minute CBC interview. NPR was like my lodestar. And Jamie said, like, this is an NPR. This person has loaded up the podcast because they want to hear you interview somebody. You don't you don't have to accelerate things. And over the last couple of years, it was 25 minutes and it was 30 minutes. And then, you know, 35, 40 minutes. And now it's rare that my interviews are less than 30, 40 minutes. I've become a little less aggressive on the edit. I used to be really aggressive with the edits. There is a balance between brevity and succinctness and not repeating things. But if you're too much on that side, you start to sound unnatural. You start to sound like the written word. When they're reading something, people notice if you keep repeating the same word or you come back to the same point. People are less forgiving about that kind of thing. Mm. But when it comes to conversation, people are just used to talking with their friends and, you know, circling back to the same jokes or illusions or it's, it's just part of natural conversation. It took me a while to get comfortable. As, as a print person or as a written word person, it, it took me a long time to get comfortable with that aspect of podcasting where you, you're not editing in the way you edit print stuff. You can't say, oh, I, I've used that word. I'm going to take it out or like it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I think it's useful when your first audience is your colleagues. That's, that's how people get better. My, my family tells me how boring my podcasts are. There's that. So like, sometimes I'll get in the car and you know, you get in the car, you turn the engine on, your Bluetooth connects and your audio plays the last thing you were, you were playing. So, so, I mean, sometimes if I'm listening to a work in progress, it'll be like a scratch version of the podcast. It'll be like me talking to, I don't know, a scientist or something. And the kids will start screaming, like, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. And if I play like four seconds of it, <laughs> I I guess I was like that when I was a kid and someone played a song I didn't like, they, they'd go crazy. So yes, I'm surrounded by critics and uh, I think I think it's good for me. Good to have an anchor, John. Yeah. <laughs> and not live in one of those bubbles where you're constantly told you're the messiah. <laughs> My kids do. So. <laughs> Underappreciated aspect of family. They're not groupies. <laughs> they're, they're the opposite of groupies. Yeah. Thanks, John, for joining us. And thank you for chatting about what it's like being Colette's podcast host on the 200th episode. I want to say congratulations. Well, thank you for uh, for paying me money to do it. May we get to another 100? I, I hope we can do this again. At the 300th episode. That's right. That's right. Oh, we'll lock it in. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 